Well, good morning, Mr. Chairman and committee member. <laughs> I do have a bill introduction. It is, oh, I'll wait for the girls to sit down, so. <sighs> They're very efficient here. A little lower, yeah, I'm so short. Yeah. All right, are you ready? Okay, it's uh, RS0672, and it's an act concerning wildlife and parks related to Jewell County authorizing the Department of Wildlife and Parks to purchase land. And this is in Senate District 36, so this is why you're seeing me this morning. Oh, I would love to come back. Any questions or objections? Seeing none, the bill is introduced. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know whether I didn't hear anything from Secretary Love. Is, is there someone here speaking on behalf of the Secretary of Wildlife and Parks? Apparently not. We'll wait a few minutes. Morning. <coughs> He's right. We we started. Well, Mr. Secretary, are you ready? We'll. Yes. I got the bill introduced. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right here, right now. Four minutes back. I was out hunting, and I ain't getting back. There's no place to hide. I couldn't find any birds. <laughs> okay. Secretary, we're ready to start. Yeah, I'm here. So you can <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm probably, probably much easier. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not. Now I am. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, Chairman Kirshen, members of the committee, it's good to see you all again. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you about um, access to hunting and fishing opportunities in Kansas. I'm Brad Loveless, the Secretary of Wildlife and Parks. Um, 
As the committee is really aware, um, our state is um, pretty shy on public lands. We have uh, less than 3% uh, public land available. That puts us at 48th um, in the country as far as, uh, as far as access to public land by, by the public. Um, did you, I apologize, I should ask this first. Did you get our, our handout of, okay, you got it, great. Thank you, thank you, okay, yeah, perfect. Um, to, and to, to challenge us a little further, um, we're kind of the victims of our own success when it comes to deer hunting. Um, um, we were, I was talking with Senator Straub about this just a couple days ago. The, the challenge is, is that because the deer resources become so valuable, landowners recognize that value and, and a lot of land is being leased up to allow particularly non-residents to come in. They pay a lot of money to come in and try to shoot a trophy Kansas deer. So what that's meant is that land that, that previously might have been available to locals, you know, to, or frankly anyone to come up and knock on the door and ask if they can hunt is no longer available because typically those lease opportunities say because, um, because of the money being paid, uh, you, you can't get on that land to hunt quail or squirrels or turkeys or anything else. Um, typically because they don't want anything happening that might interfere with their, their deer hunting. So a lot, of, a lot of land has been kind of taken out of uh, public access that traditionally was available because of that, that deer market. We are happy that, uh, that those landowners, of course, are making money off of that. They, they are trying to figure out how the way to make a living um, uh, off their land, and, and we don't begrudge them that at all, but it's just a natural thing that's happened because of the high demand. The, so our, the challenge for us becomes more complex with time, um, but we continue to be focused on doing everything we can to um, make great opportunities available and to increase uh, the number of Kansans and non-residents that want to come and enjoy those resources. This has led to a few programs. Um, the first I'll mention is the Walk-In uh, Hunting Access Program, or WEHA. And, um, I won't say a lot about it today because I've talked with you about it in the past, but I do something. I was just reading the other day this big old tome. Uh, I, I've been carrying it around with me, so it's kind of dog-eared, but this is um, a national evaluation of, of hunting and shooting access in the United States. The picture on it is from Kansas because the Kansas Walk-In Hunting Access Program um, was the first of its kind. Many states have tried to model it afterwards, and we're proud of it, and we, we continue to be recognized as a leader when it comes to figuring out ways to work with private landowners to allow access. So pretty, pretty proud of that. In addition to walk-in hunting, we have um, walk-in fishing access, WEFA, and then also Community Fisheries Assistance Program. So we all got limitations. Um, because of the ones that we're faced with, we constantly look to make those programs better. And I want to talk to you about a few things we've done to try to make them better. Um, our our iWeeha, or, or basically electronic WeHa program, is one that we've instituted a couple of years ago that's really grown in leaps and bounds. It's essentially doubled each year since we started it because our problem historically was the walk-in hunting access that we had typically was in western Kansas. And so, um, people in our most populous parts of the state had to drive quite a ways to um, benefit from that, and they did it. And people from all across the United States come to Kansas to hunt because of that program. So it's been successful, but it still is an inconvenience if you want to get out for you know part of a day and hunt. And so this electronic walk-in program is really neat because um, Landowners around urban areas typically are worried about getting overrun. There's a lot of people that are interested in hunting. They'd love to just go a few miles away and do that. And, but on, on that land, which is typically smaller than the properties people have in western Kansas, um, it can be overly used pretty quickly. And landowners are, are guarded against that, no surprise. So the, this program is a, basically a sign-in program where you have an electronic system where if, if I want to uh, come and hunt on, on uh, 
Senator Kirshen's property tomorrow, and he's in this program, I would sign in, and, and it may say he'll allow two hunters per day or four hunters per day or whatever. I'll sign in. It's first come, first served. And, uh, but once that second hunter signs in, then it's everybody knows. Nobody, I'm not, nobody else is going to drive out there tomorrow hoping to hunt because they can look and see there's no space for me tomorrow. They'll try another day. So it allows the, the landowner who wants to share that resource, uh, but in a, in a measured way, in a reasonable way. And so this is tailored to meet the needs of the landowner and also what the land will give us. So it's been a really good program, uh, especially here in eastern Kansas. And... Um, and we've done real well with it. Uh, we, of course, with all programs, we started it a few years ago. I think it was four years ago. We, we recognized there were some bugs involved, and so we've been working those out each time. Hunters are, are smart people. They figure out ways to, to work a system. And uh, so, so we've, had, we've learned uh, as we've realized uh, weaknesses in the system, but it's by and large working very well. The neat thing, one of the majors of that, of course, is we get terrific comments from people who are, are using that program, and, but also we have positive comments from the, the landowners because they want people to come out and be able to, to, to share their land with them. Uh, so this really works. It's a win-win as long as it, uh, it, we keep it uh, to meet everyone's expectations, and so far we've been uh, doing a good job of that. So that's a good program. We'll continue to work on that. Yes, sir. Accident. Can I register for all of them? No, no. That that's one of the things. Early on, we thought, well, people just sign up and they'll they won't be greedy. Well, sometimes people are, and so they want to hedge their bets. So they'll say, I'm going to sign up for these couple, and I'll go into this one. And if it's not as good as I thought, then I'll run over to this other one. Well, th that we we won't allow that anymore. Um, uh, and other things were happening where sometimes, if people like to attract the land, say say um, you and I were both. Um, interested in hunting Senator Dahl's land for turkey, um, I might say, well, I'll get a buddy to sign up for the one spot so, so I don't have any competition and that buddy won't show up, then I'll have it all to myself. So people are doing things like that. So now we have the ability to track, you know, people who are doing that and, and they become uh, ineligible uh, if they don't treat the system fairly. So that's the nice thing about computer systems these days. You can, you can track that information and, uh, and, and try, to, try to raise the bar of accountability. Also, if a hunter comes in, the other part is every, every once in a while folks are not responsible. If, if a person comes in and doesn't shut, shut a gate like they're supposed to, then, then the landowner tells us and, and we know about that and we can talk with that hunter or say, you're not going to be able to hunt the rest of the season on these Iweha properties because you didn't do a good job of taking care of the landowner, right? So it's a lot more interactive. And uh, I think that the landowners, we, we have had great re-enrollment there, I think because the landowners feel like they're being taken care of. And the other thing uh, I might mention, and you all probably have experience with this, hunters are, when they have a good experience or when, when someone allows them to hunt on their land, even if you don't see a bird, um, you're appreciative of that. I know I am. And so um, the landowners get the benefit of, of working with people that are very thankful for the opportunity. So it's, it's kind of a neat program. We're really happy with it and continue to improve it over time. One thing I'll mention, I just found out about this the other day, so we're looking into it. This is another twist on that. We... When you enroll your land in, in the IWEHA pro program, based on the length of season that you allow people to come in, the number of species that can be hunted on your property, um, we adjust rates some. So there's this kind of a sliding scale. If you have higher quality land, can accommodate more, more types of hunting, we, we can incentivize you more in that payment. But it's pretty, it's pretty static. I just heard about this. I so new I haven't even talked to my staff, so if they're listening, don't be angry with me, but I'm excited about it because it's really a market-based program. So if uh, it, in Montana, they've started this a couple of years ago where they pay landowners based on the amount of usage on their land. So it, it, as opposed to us judging if this will be good for a whole bunch of species and we should pay you more, 
basically um, we ad would advertise what we think are good on that land, what you can go after. Um, but ultimately, your payment comes down to how many people actually went out and used it. Right? So you have great habitat, and um, and people of maybe you work hard to provide better habitat for wildlife. You get incentivized for that um, by the payment that you ultimately get. More users equal, equal more payment. So it, it actually gets closer almost to that lease system where people pay you based on the value and better land, a better hunting experience can uh, allow for higher payments. So it incentivizes good conservation by landowners. So we think it's a neat program. Uh, again, I, I haven't discussed it with a single one of my staff, but I heard about it and I was excited. So I thought I'd mention it to you. Um, so I'm probably getting it, uh, out over my skis. But um, another program I want to mention, oh, I mentioned the, the uh, walk-in fishing. That's another really neat program that people appreciate. Um, our biologists go out to um, landowners and say, hey, you have a, 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 a pond here. Uh, if you'd be open to uh, us putting it in this program, I'll do an assessment. We'll figure out if it, the nature of fishery and all that stuff. And... Uh, that is a great program across the state. Typically, ponds um, are what, what landowners have to offer, but um, can be tr some of the best quality fishing in the state. Of course, you all know is in farm ponds, and so that's been a good program, too. Um, another program I'd like to mention is our special hunts program. Again, a tailored program. We have properties around the state. We, we try to be efficient when it comes to properties. Um, this this Lovewell idea is is adding ground adjacent to land we already have around Lovewell Reservoir where there's a lot of a demand. Um, but sometimes we have smaller properties. Oftentimes they were donated to us years ago, um, and, and, but they can't handle a lot of pressure. So as opposed to just opening them up like, like you know, you would Cheyenne Bottoms, um, something really big, we'll have them in our special hunts program. So We'll design it so based on the species that are available there, whether it's quail or pheasant or waterfowl or deer or turkeys, we'll uh, design uh, this draw program so you can have a, a finite number of hunts, maybe a half dozen, maybe maybe two dozen um, over the course of the season. We spread those out so so the day that, that um, Senator Ware gets to come out um, is different from the day when Senator Francisco gets to come out, right? So we space those out so people can have a good quality hunting experience. And it's not overutilized. It's not overrun with hunters. So the idea is to do proper conservation for the wildlife, but also allow the public to enjoy that. And so a, a good share of that program, because we're always looking to recruit uh, new hunters and anglers, uh, a good share of that program is geared toward youth hunt programs, where if you have a uh, someone under 18, you can bring them out and you can both hunt, but you have to bring that young person to expose them to that. Um, I, I met, might mention just a couple of our, of our fishing program. We, the, I mentioned the walk-in fishing access. The Community of Fish, Fisheries Assistant Program is, is a really good one where we work with um, communities that have a, a water body close to town typically, and we'll put that in that program. That allows us to stock it. That allows the community, if they want to, to charge a fee to help help cover their costs to manage that, that property. But these are often really in or very close to the edge of towns. And so um, easy access for people, particularly in that community. And so those have been popular. We have those across the state. And then a couple programs, uh, urban catfishing um, is one that we've done in places where there's high use. It just can't handle um, that high use without supplemental stockings. We, in urban areas, that's particularly true. We want people to come in and enjoy that fishing experience, be able to take home fish to eat if they want. Oftentimes, the thing that helps us is channel catfish. We can produce those. We're very good at making those, growing them up to a catchable size. And we can stock those kind of over and over again because of the intense pressure in those urban settings. The last one I'll mention like that is our, our trout stocking program. Kansas is warm enough in the summer that trout don't survive through, but we developed a very profitable, pro not I wouldn't say profitable, a program that pays for itself. That's our standard. Um, when it comes to um, trout stockings, and this is both in rural areas associated with some of our, our um, 
our state parks, but also in urban areas. We just opened up a pond um, in Emporia. If you're driving through Emporia, there, King Lake is, is just on the north side of the highway, right across from campus. Great access for people from town, and we've been stocking that. And that just got entered into our, our trout stocking program this winter. And so that's a put and take program. Those fish aren't gonna survive through the summer, so we want people to come in and catch them. And they're very popular. Um, and uh, I, I've enjoyed that myself. I've taken my grandkids to those. And uh, they're a great way to fish on a sunny day in the middle of winter when, uh, when you wouldn't think you could be fishing, you can be very successful. So that's been a good program. Let's see. I get excited, I lose track of where I'm at. Um, so the last thing I'll mention is uh, access to, to new lands. Um, because of the way our laws are set up right now, um, we need to have a bill introduced and have it run through the legislature if we wanna purchase land more than a quarter section, more than 160 acres. So that's a, that's a pretty low bar. There's, there's not a lot of land that comes available to us. Typically, like I said, on the edge of a property we already have, neighbors will wanna sell. Typically, it's more than 160 acres. So we start the process of working through you all, um, which we're happy to do. Um, the things that we've instituted in the last few years since I've been around that we didn't always do was we we first go to the local legislators. We talk to them about the idea and make sure it makes sense to them. We work with local Farm Bureau, local Kansas Livestock Association representatives, talk with them about the idea. And, uh, and then of course we bring it to you all. And um, so that's a process we're getting, we think we're getting better at being more transparent uh, with everyone involved. And that's important to you all, it's important to us too. We wanna be good neighbors. And uh, importantly, we can't pay more than the appraised value. So we, if, if a, a neighbor says, oh, I want that ground. Well, uh, uh, one thing I should mention, if there's farming to be done or grazing to be done, we always go to the, the locals to say, hey, you're already farming down the road. You wanna farm this too. We'll take a share, but basically you can, you can farm it for yourself. Um, that's great with us. We aren't looking to become you know, row crop um, raisers, we simply want the ground so the public can get access to it. And so uh, we try to work with everyone cooperatively um, and, and then eventually, if, if that works the right way, we, then we hope the legislature would approve that. Um, the, the latest idea, as you mentioned, Senator, was um, working on a piece on the west end of Lovewell Reservoir, 264 acres, um, that would be a nice addition. We've been hoping uh, to, to get it for several years um, now it appears like we might have an opportunity to do that. The governor actually put money in the budget. We, we typically use the fees that we get from anglers and, and hunting licenses. Um, but in this case, the governor actually said it was important and which we really appreciated to, to provide more access to the, the, the point of our, our conversation this morning. So we're very optimistic about that. Um, I've rambled long enough. Uh, I would love to visit with you, or answer any questions if, if you have any. Thank you very much, Chairman, and thank you for coming and your passionate uh, as you were uh, talking about so many areas. I, I wrote down about 15 questions, and <laughs> obviously you're not going to get through all of them. <clears throat> uh, when you talked about the Kansas rakes almost last in public land, uh, 48th, and, uh, and of course you're trying to open up more honey uh, and walk-ins and so on, and I appreciate you doing that. Um, then at the end, you start talking a little bit about the payments, but my first question is, uh, what kind of payments do the, uh, the farmers get if they're gonna open up their land? And then secondly, uh, I didn't see a position on the web, website, you know, where I could get to that. And, and do you track if whoever gets on that website when someone, uh, say Senator uh, Kirshen wants to get on one and then I do and whatever, um, I don't know, do you keep track how many people hit that website to get on there or, or, or what? So yeah, I, We're I, certainly aware, we don't track 
individuals unless there's a problem. But we, we do track the, the demand for that, the, the level of usage. That's really important to us. So we, we do keep, keep an eye on that for sure. My question first was the, the payment. What's, if, if, I, I was, if I was a farmer and I wanted to come to my land, uh, it sounds like they, at least they get something for it. Or, or how does that work? I do, and I apologize. I, I've, I've, lo I've known that and I've, I've lost it. Um, but I, I'll be glad to check and get back to you. It's, um, it's dollars per acre, and, um, but I've, I've and, and, it, and it is a sliding scale based on what, what they're actually offering, uh, the opportunities for the users. I can't remember those, those costs per acre, but I'll be glad to get those to you. In fact, I'll, I'll get them to, to you and also Chairman Kirsten, so, and it'll show you the whole range. Let me write that down before I forget. Yeah, okay, I just wanted to, because the, the reason I'm asking that, because right away when you says 48 out of 50, uh, we're, we're, we're pretty low down there, but people are le leasing their land to make another money for other groups are coming in. And I, it has to be, a, I don't know how much they get, but they have to get a good amount of money for that. And so it has to be some kind of incentive for those farmers to have other people, to have our public people to do it also. So I figured that's why you're doing it, and that's why I'm asking that question. Yeah, you're exactly right. Um, uh, when they're leasing land for deer hunting, um, it, it, you know, I've heard people talk about 10 or even $15 per acre on really high quality land, and that's, obviously you multiply that out over a large tract, it's an awful lot of money, but that's what people are willing to, to spend. And one of the problems we've had over the years with this walk-in hunting program is, People come from out of state, they, they go to different properties, they see a great one. It's not, it's had happened plenty of times where they found out who the landowner is, gone to them and say, I'll pay you, you know, this much more if you just let me come on and, and you know, hunt deer on your ground. So that happens just quite a bit. Um, again, it's, it's, you're a victim of your own success. You try to do, get the best pieces of land and sometimes they get leased out from under you, but that, that happens sometimes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Director. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I've got a question and a follow-up too, but the first one's going to be kind of a follow-up to Senator Reichman. When you talk about, this is less than 3%, but let's just use 3%. 3% of Kansas might be compared to 10% in some other smaller state. So are they basing that on acreage in that state or are they basing that on percentage of land? Yeah, it's, it's percentage of land in the whole state and what we have. And I, and I should mention, <clears throat> very fair question, that doesn't include the, the, the walk-in hunting access. That obviously changes the game in Kansas and has been successful. It's just, it's something we have to pay extra for. So it's not included under, you know, the public land umbrella, but it's definitely available for p people for hunting. Okay, so it's based on percentage as well. Yep, it is. Uh, my second question, Mr. Chairman, uh, when you talk about watersheds, uh, I think there's some watersheds out there that have got federal grants that you're supposed to allow people to fish on. I had heard that. I don't know that for a fact. I wonder if, if the state, do you ever look at the federal stuff and make sure that people are aware of all the watersheds they could get on with, with the federal grants? Yeah. You know, I, I would think that would be a, a service to the public because I think somebody's got a lot of money to put a watershed on their place. Nobody knows you can get in there. So right. you might talk about that. I'll be glad to check on that. I'm not aware of a requirement that those folks allow public access to those watershed lakes. Um, I've certainly been turned down a, a, a few times when I wanted to go out there and hunt with my kids. So, but I'll check on that and let you know, because to your point, we absolutely do that. Um, we have a few, a couple um, federal refuges, uh, one right down the road, Flint Hills Refuge by Emporia and Hartford. And um, so we definitely uh, advertise those as places that are options for people to go also. So, yeah. And this is for fishing I'm talking about. Oh, I'm sorry. So, and for fishing, same way. Um, like Kerwin is not a Corps of Engineers lake. It's a Bureau of Reclamation lake out in northwest Kansas, a great fishery. We, we don't have property around that. Um, 
but yet we, we advertise it. Just like everything else, we monitor it. When you get, I hope you all get our Wildlife and Parks magazine, um, the issue coming out in March and April, uh, we'll have the fishing forecast for the whole state, it's, and it has Kerwin in it and all those other places too. So the one I'd be looking at would be the small uh, watersheds. That's yeah, so you know, where they put in eight hundred thousand or a million yeah, dollars, and yeah. there's a lot of those out there. Yep, yeah, I, I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I, yeah. I, I know exactly what you're talking about, and I'll, I'll check on those. Yep, I'll let you know. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. Uh, I've been getting emails from folks across the state really wanting to have more access for the public. Is there a way, I guess, especially on, in your electronic sign-up system, to restrict that to only Kansas residents and not allowing out-of-state folk? Would that, is that, does that fit in the picture? Well, it could. We haven't, we haven't done that. Um, as long as they have a, a license to, to fish or hunt in Kansas, we allow them access. But, and we haven't restricted it in that way yet. Um, I should mention, I'm glad you brought that up. I should have said this in the very beginning. We do a lot of surveys. In fact, people get tired of them and we're trying to be more efficient. Um, but we do a lot of surveys because we want to know what people are thinking and what their preferences are and what's working and what's not working. Um, at the end of the surveys, we always have an opportunity for them to just fill in comments. Um, the most common comments uh, in a single category, the most common uh, comment we get in our hunting surveys is, I, I can't hunt where I always used to, so lack of access. And so I, I don't know if you guys were reading our survey results or what, but it's exactly what you're asking about today is, is the most common concern. Of course, we, we have seen a decline um, in uh, hunting license sales for residents, still a high demand for non-residents, but we're seeing some decline in residents. And so, and when we talk to them one-on-one -on -one or, or read the surveys they turn in, it typically comes down to, I don't have places to go anymore like I used to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Brad. Um, I do have a, just an observation here on the ranking of us being 48th out of 50 states. We could look at that the opposite way and look at it that we're ranked third in, in private land ownership and mm -hmm. So it just depends how you look at it. Um, but being, you know, uh, raised in central Kansas on a farm and, um, you know, my whole entire family loves to hunt and fish and, you know, cultivating the land, grazing cattle, living that kind of lifestyle, it's somewhat of a reward to be able to trophy hunt on your own land. True. So if, you know, when people complain about being able to walk in on land and knock on someone's door and ask if they can hunt, it would be no different than me going into a gated neighborhood in Overland Park, knocking on the door, hey, could I swim in your pool? <laughs> <laughs> so it really just depends how we, how we look at this. But uh, I'm, I'm gonna ask, my question is, what is the largest complaint um, is it lack of access for deer hunting, lack of access for public fishing, lack of access for public duck hunting? Because I know of lots of places you can hunt and fish on public lands, but trophy deer hunting is, it is something that's somewhat reserved for the elite. Right, it, it is. And that really goes against our mission. We're trying to allow access for everyone, but it's a limited resource, as you point out, we absolutely don't begrudge any landowner the ability to use it themselves or invite only certain people on to hunt. That's the way things work. It needs to be that way. Um, and I know as you live close to more urban areas, I've been at Senator McGinn's property and she's close enough to big towns that I know she gets a lot of requests um, to hunt. And sometimes it can be um, overwhelming, right? Having to put up with all that. Um, but. Um, we certainly understand that's a limited resource. I would say to your question about uh, the, the most frequent one, um, Kansas, everybody would like to shoot a monster, you know, white-tailed deer. Um, but I think um, more than that, that's not the complaint we get. It's just access, just a place to go that's convenient. And I think it's somewhat nostalgic. I was talking with Representative Corbett about this the other day. In Iowa, so here's the difference. 
in Iowa, we, we allow about 25% of our, um, our antler permits to go to non-residents. That's a huge amount, much higher than uh, any other trophy state. By comparison, Iowa's another trophy deer state. They allow 5% non-residents to come in and hunt. So you'd think, okay, the, the demand isn't there for non-residents to pay a lot of money to, to hunt on that land and lease it up. But in Iowa, what's happened is um, the residents have started leasing that land, right? To your point, if, if you may just have to pay to access that kind of really top-notch hunting. And so that's what's happened in Iowa, but we're not there yet. I think people still have a recollection. I know when, when I was raising my kids, we could go outside of town. We knew the folks you, from the grocery or from church, and you could go and you know, mention to them, hey, is it okay if we walk back there and look for some quail? It wasn't a big deal, but that's changed. And, um, and in Kansas, I haven't had the thought in my mind yet of going to lease that person's land just for myself. It doesn't feel really right to me, but at the same time, people have to figure out their own solution to, to get you know, what they want. So, so there's, there's a, a, a market at play here. That we're that we're learning about. Thank you for the lead up. How did you know I was next? Um, I, I was looking around on your website and I see the WIA program, but I don't see anything that explains to the landowner how much they would get paid. Okay. And I don't see anything on your website. I I mean, my only conversation has been with Charlie Cope. Yep. Uh, down there in Wichita, and he's with the federal group, right? No, he's ours. Charlie's our biologist. But, you know, he's the only one that has explained to me pricing and things like that, but um, that there's nothing on the website to, to do that just to see if you might be interested. But I guess, um, you know, I can't let this meeting end without my comments about the guides and what are the others called, the, the scouts or the uh, outfitters, yeah. Right. And who knock on my door. And, you know, I know that they're not locals because um, they can't say, I'm a friend of your uncle's from a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, I look at their license tag, and it's not a Sedgwick County tag. And you ask them, and I, I have to share, I had one guy that was actually honest with me. He told me that he was a, a scout, but, um, but they never offer money. Mm -hmm. And I think of the days when, and this has been 20, 30 years ago, um, it was always a tradition that when they hunt on your property, you know, they'll, they offer you something. Right. Right. And now, nothing. And then you have to worry about the neighbor's farm next door and somebody else hunting next to it. Um, or I've had people, we didn't get anything today. Can we come back tonight? Um, you know, so to me, I think there needs to be um, etiquette training for <laughs> hunters because I still go back to I pay the taxes, I grow the food and the cover, or the animals, and I understand that we need to manage deer, and we certainly need to take care of our geese, uh, for sure. But when people are just pounding on your door and the dogs start barking, and, and you know, you don't know them at all, um, and, you know, I, I, I just, I find that to be a little bit disrespectful. So, and then, of course, they've got your app, so if you say, somebody's going to hunt there tomorrow, Oh, well, you own this one too, don't you? You know, they got their whole Rolodex. I, yeah, they're pretty high tech when it comes and, to that. You know, I just, you know, you guys have your, what, every other month meetings, and I don't know if you guys ever talk about that, because I, I remember a few years ago, Senator Kirshen let me have a bill, and it had to do with, uh, we changed something on public lands, and so they just swarmed all the private lands. Mm. And all I wanted was... Um, if you were a scout or an outfitter, to just register. Mm -hmm. Didn't need any money, just wanted your name on the list so that when you come to my door and you're not telling me the truth, I can look them up. Because what they also do is they all, so some of them know each other. 
So I've had one group here, and they're buddies of this group that's hunting over here. Oh, yeah. And again, I go back to not one offered anything. Mm -hmm. This year, I did finally get somebody to offer. Did you really? Okay. Well, that's good. Well, we, I'm glad you brought up guides and outfitters because we have been having a lot of conversations with them uh, probably t a little over two years ago as I was tr getting to learn the landscape of Kansas. Um, there was a lot of pressure, especially for waterfowl hunting. And, uh, and so we were having a lot of conversations, talking with our public lands managers. And what we found was that um, there's been a proliferation of non-residents, or I would say fly-by-night guides. Um, they see an opportunity to make money. That attracts them. And so um, they, they buy a bunch of goose and duck decoys and put them in a trailer, and they follow the geese around. They have scouts that go out and see where they're landing. Then they go ask, ask permission. Now, that's in contrast with the, the resident guides and outfitters who have been, who are business people in our communities. So we started meeting. We put out a call to all these folks. There's hundreds of them in Kansas. If you look up deer hunting and wherever, I mean, these, all these guides and outfitters come up. So we put out a call and said, we want to meet with you. We want to understand how your business works, how we can work more effectively together. Um, what we found was a lot of them, all the ones that came to visit with us, and we've had probably four meetings. The last meeting was with our commission to share information. Um, we've had, I'd say, probably 30 or 40 um, guide outfitters that we've met with over these couple of years. And the ones that are businesses, I can think of one in, in uh, Great Bend, and they said, look, we're members of the Chamber of Commerce. We pay taxes. And, and they, they said that to contrast themselves with a lot of these other folks who are meeting their hunters out in the middle of the field. They, they got in touch on the internet. They meet out in the middle of the field. They trade, everything's in cash. They don't pay any sales taxes in Kansas. And they, and they tend to abuse landowners. Whereas if, if I'm a local outfitter, I'm, the neat thing about working with them is I've realized um, they have the same interest in sustainable conservation of our resources as our agency does, right? They don't want to use up everything, and then they'll be out of business. So they really want to manage things, uh, both in terms of the wildlife and also the relationships with landowners, to take care of them. And so they are typically great neighbors, the kind of people you want to work with, whereas these folks, other folks kind of blow in. They may be following waterfowl, which they do as they're migrating, you know, from the north in the fall. And they'll knock on doors. They'll come back to your, whereas a, a resident outfitter might come and bring some clients in one day and then give a field a few days to rest so those geese and ducks can continue to come back. Non-residents not interested in that. They'll, they'll move three counties away to chase the birds after they scare them off your property. So they'll hunt them day after day till they're gone. Um, and, they, and they don't care if you're happy with them or not because they'll probably never be back again. Whereas the, the resident ones have a business relationship. You're part of that. So they'd, they'd pay you money. They'd compensate you for being able to use their land. So they came as a part of the, uh, as a result of these conversations, we said, so how do we make things better? And they said, regulate us, right? Which we used to do. And that changed, I don't know all the history of that, but it, it got bad enough that it kind of dissolved, I think. Um, and we said to them, we, we aren't interested in, in over, you know, dictating what you do, but we are interested in you maintaining high quality um, resource for people that want to come in and use you. So we said, if you folks develop standards um, of, of practice, right, some, some uh, level of certification that you guys have for each other, right, where you, for instance, are bonded, which none of these fly-by-nighters are, have, have insurance, no first aid CPR, basic things to show your responsible business that will take care of people, um, then you get this certification for Kansas. Is there a fee? I don't know. I don't care. It, the important thing is that we develop a standard where uh, a, a person can say, I want to have a quality hunting experience. Who should I go to? It'll be evidence. These are people that per the state of Kansas, are in good standing. Um, 
per the guides and outfitters' own, sta own um, standards. And so we love that idea, and we're talking to them. They kind of tend to be independent people, so the idea of getting together and cooperating is not, while they cooperate amongst, between each other locally, um, they, they aren't kind of joiners who want to have a club of guides and outfitters. So, um, but nevertheless, they told us we really do desire to have a standard that's meaningful to people because, frankly, these other folks are undercutting them, and they're giving them a bad name, as you've experienced there. They don't treat people well, and they don't treat wildlife well. So we'd like to see improvements in that. We're having those discussions ongoing and encouraging the guides and outfitters to um, think about what they want, and, uh, and we told them we'll work with you. I remember the <clears throat> discussion about the licensing, and that that one was probably 12, 14 years ago. And what I remember, the people that showed up, the ones that were um, professional outfitters, wanted to hang around forever and ever, they were all for it. Yeah. And then you had the other half that didn't want it at all. So yeah. yep. um, I'm, I'm for bringing it back. So I, I like that idea, too, because basically it – supports Kansas business people. And, um, and if you aren't going to play by reasonable rules, then uh, you don't get much business. And I, I think that should be evident to a person who's looking for that service. Next we have Senator Dahl. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. First thing I'll comment is that other than uh, harvest, probably the biggest tourism that we have for many of our communities, or smaller communities for their small hotels and things, is opening day of pheasant season, Amen. deer season, and that sort of thing. So to limit out-of-state people would be a huge blow to the economy of a lot of our, our smaller communities. Two is, let's say that I signed up for this to go hunting and such, and my cousin comes in from Hiawatha who hadn't signed up or whatever. Mm -hmm. Does, can I be the only one to hunt, or can he come with me on my name on that to hunt? You know, um, I'm sure he can come along. If you wanted to bring anybody along, could. That, that it'll be, you know, the number of hunters allowed will be listed on there. So if they're a non-hunting partner, that wouldn't be any problem at all. If, I, if you wanted to bring your, your granddaughter or, or you know, a, a new person who's trying to figure out what this hunting is all about, that'd be fine. It's not about the number of boots on the ground, it's the number of hunters. And I, um, you mentioned about the problem. We, I, I'm right with you. We, we really benefit from non-residents coming in. And one thing I should alert you uh, to um, is there's, there's growing pressure. We've been very successful when it comes to managing our waterfowl areas, and we're very popular. That's happened in the last several years, it's built and built. I was visiting with a young woman who was out in um, north central Kansas at Ringneck Ranch. She came clear from North Carolina with some folks that I work with on the East Coast, and I recommended come out to Kansas. We have a lot of places to choose from, and they, they wanted to go out there. It's a place where you can stay overnight. They have, have really nice accommodations, and they, they sit out birds. Um, so it's a guided hunting experience. Um, and she mentioned to me that her her boyfriend from back in North Carolina comes out to Kansas every year uh, after Christmas to hunt waterfowl with his buddies. Every year they come, they stay for a week, they spend money, um, and uh, because they say Kansas is the new Arkansas when it comes to hunting. Arkansas has had a reputation for 100 years to be a great duck state, but they say things have changed. Part of that's because our folks have been very good at, at developing um, the infrastructure in our wildlife areas um, to manage vegetation and water levels, and that's the key to waterfowl management. So our folks have been very good, but the interest in non-residents has gone up, and in some places, um, we actually have 50% of the people that hunt there in a given season will be non-residents, especially ones like in southeast Kansas, down your familiar center, um, around St. Paul, we have the Neosho Wildlife Area, very popular with non-residents, hunters, and that happens to be where this gal's boyfriend and his buddies came every year. Um, here's, here's something I would point out to you. This is an interesting observation, because we're trying to adjust our regulations so that the birds aren't unduly harassed and that everybody gets a fair shot. But at the, we, in the parking lot down there at Neosho, um, 
I, our, our manager down there um, commented to me that when uh, first thing in the morning, they can't get on the water until um, starting at five in the morning. People used to camp out. They'd get their spot, they'd camp out overnight in the marsh, in the winter, because they wanted to preserve their spot, right? Senator Kirshen wouldn't do that. I can tell by your expression. <laughs> but these folks are crazy about it, so they do that. Um, so we've tried to limit that by limiting the hours and things like that. When um, uh, at the OSHO, the comment our public lands managers get when a resident pulls in there and there's 15 trucks and trailers there, um, the resident says, holy cow, this place is covered up. It's way too crowded. The non-residents come in and say, where is everybody? This is an incredible spot. So, so it's your point of reference. A lot of these places, people come from places where they're overrun with hunters and they can't believe how high a quality resource we have here and how few people are using it. So matter of perspective. I want to say that's why we set this meeting up because... Thank you very much for coming and, and getting a, your side of what's going on and so we can have a conversation about but I get to ask this all the time about hunting and we always let everybody hunt. We don't have, if you can maybe shoot a dove, that's all. We, <laughs> we don't have feds like we used to have. But, but I know the hunting was, we, when we as kids, we was out there, it, those, one of your neighbors, probably your uncles, and heck, nobody know, may know the difference. Yep. But anyway, but I want to have a conversation. Uh, just Lisa, so I want you, glad we had this meeting so we, so we can go back and say, yes, we've talked about that. It's difficult to fi make that, fi how it fairness is, is required, but we're working on it of some kind. Right. So. I, I appreciate your interest. We work on this every day, but we're always interested in new ideas, ways we can be more effective. I'm still very optimistic. Kansas is a gem. You all know that. Um, we're trying to share it responsibly in a way that can be sustained with both residents and non-residents. And, and we think we're in a good place, but we're just trying to get better with time. Outside question, can, who can, can a landowner shoot a feral pig on their property? Well, in Kansas, you can't, and I'll tell you why. In other states, we, we have done a really good job of keeping feral pigs out of Kansas. Um, if you go to Oklahoma, you, there's no license required, there's no season, you shoot all the pigs you want, anytime you want, because they're such a problem. They create a lot of damage, particularly to ag agricultural crops. Um, Arkansas has a problem with them, and so does Missouri. They spend millions of dollars every year to try to reduce the numbers. In Kansas, because we've been super aggressive at this, we're down to one property where the landowner doesn't want us to remove those pigs. And so, but everybody around it is good with it, and so we have essentially no feral pig problem. If we were to allow, it's kind of counterintuitive. You say, well, if you don't want them, then people should be able to shoot them. The problem is, as we've talked about several times, you know, follow the money. If, we were, if people were allowed to shoot feral pigs, then some people would say, I can make money if I release hogs and then invite people, charge them to come in on my place and hunt. And so, so by not allowing them to be hunted, you take away that market. And, and that's one of the things that's helped us be successful. It takes away the temptation for people to release them. It still happens sometimes, but we can pretty quickly locate those based on the damage complaints, get in there and eradicate those, those animals. But the landlord, does he, is he out of line if he does eliminate one? Or? If, well, so on your land, if you have an animal doing depredation, we've got all sorts of things you can do personally to protect your, your property. Yeah, that's never a problem. But we don't want uh, the guy down the road saying, I, th I think I've seen some hogs on your place. I'm going to come down and hunt them. It's different. Landowner has all kinds of rights to protect their property when it comes to, li when it comes to damage. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, thank you. One more question. Yeah. It's on this, not on the same topic. Uh, a couple years ago, we, they in, instituted this new hunting at night predator. Yeah. And how's that, how's that working out? Yeah, interesting. Um, we've been talking about that recently. So the new technology was called night vision scopes. And uh, they, they pick up a thermal image out there. And they're remarkable in what a clear picture you can get of an animal at 200, 300, 400 yards away. Um, the request was that we make those legal for nighttime hunting. We said, 
let's, let's try this. Um, we, we don't like to get in the way of ideas if we can't see a, a clear problem with them. So we said, let's try this. Um, we allowed it outside of the deer season because we knew there'd be a temptation because deer are so sought after. So we said outside the deer season um, uh, to hunt coyotes. And, um, and we thought, we, we put a little registration fee, I think it was 250, simply to see how many of them there are out there. If nobody was interested, I mean, the scopes at the time were minimum $3,000. We thought, who's gonna pay that for a scope to hunt you know, coyotes at night. Well, turned out a lot of people were willing to pay that. I think, I think we had 4,000 people sign up the first year for, you know, got a permit. And then the next year it was down a little bit, 3,000 3, something. But so thousands of people have taken us up on that and they're buying these expensive scopes. And um, it seems to be working pretty well, but we only have a couple years worth of data. We said, we'll try it for a few years and then review the data, and we're in the process of that right now. So I'd be glad to follow up with you and let you know what our results are. One of our worries was, of course, and the reason why we kept it out of deer season was because they'd be tempted to shoot that big buck they've always been after. But another one is bobcats. They hunt at night, and they are not legal to shoot with this, but um, we're concerned that some people might be. So we're trying to monitor all that and see if it's working or not. Mary has one more question. Yeah. Yeah, just quickly uh, on on that topic, uh, safety, nighttime right. guns. Uh, how 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 much or little problem have we had with that? Yeah, we we don't know of any safety problems from it. Of course, you worry. One of the the central tenets in hunting is always know what's behind you. Well, at night it's it's hard to see. Certainly with the naked eye, you can see thermally. If, if there's a person or a cow or a horse behind, just like you pick up that coyote that you're looking at. Um, but we don't allow it on public lands because of multiple uses out there. We don't want to discourage a person from camping or walking at night to look for owls um, on public lands. So we don't allow them on our lands. Um, but um, we haven't noted any safety problems from them yet, but that's part of our evaluation. If people feel like Folks are driving down the road and shooting, you know, a coyote in your backyard. I mean, I, half the nights, it seems like those coyotes out my back window aren't 30 yards away the way they're yipping. And, and I, you know, that would be terrible if people were shooting, you know, irresponsibly. So far, no complaints, but that'll be part of our evaluation. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. For Thank you. Today. We appreciate you very much Thank updating you. us on where we're at there. So Thank you. Come anytime. Committee, we are adjourned. <laughs>